Dale, thank you so much for for coming on and doing this. This is a uh, this is super exciting. And um, just as someone who has has watched you, followed you for a long time um, in the game, and I'm super excited to have you on here. So thanks for doing this. Pleasure, no problem. <laughs> what uh, what have you what have you been up to? I mean, you're right. You're so authentically in the bush right now. This is so. This is the most authentic Dale Stain I think you can get. Um, so what have you been up to recently? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I live in Cape Town. Uh, so I've been down in Cape Town. And um, I mean, I haven't officially retired from cricket. So I'm just a little bit more picky and choosy as to what I want to go to. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. But unfortunately, I think if you're not playing all the time, you don't always get the invites. Um, I was told that. But somehow my phone still seems to ring all the time. <laughs> the coach is calling me. He's like, are you available for this? Or can you come in as a replacement for the 100? But um <clears throat> But yeah, I've just been kind of taking time off. Uh, I'm now visiting family in Palabora where I grew up. So that's in the complete opposite end of, of South Africa. It's like in the Kruger. I am like, I am in the bush like right now. It is, it's ridiculous. Um, but it's, yeah, it's where I grew up. I love it. Yeah. And yeah, it's taking a bit of time off, eh, to be mm. honest with you. Um, yeah, the whole quarantine and then four week training process to lead up to a tournament and then living in a hotel and going to a cricket ground just it doesn't have as much appeal to me as as um as it did when we were playing when i didn't have those restrictions you know so yeah so i'm a little bit more picky and choosy as to what i want to do yeah uh, and i mean if anyone's looking and following your instagrams and your social media it's like there's a lot of fishing there's a lot of surfing and uh there's there's loads of stuff that you're you're clearly just right out in nature. Um, is is that stuff that you have always naturally done as as someone? Is that something you've always always been drawn to? Getting out into nature, being out in the bush, like where you are right now. Yeah, I grew up here in this in this town in Palabora. Um, I'm actually at my grand's house right now, and um, <clears throat> I mean you couldn't get more in the bush. This is part of the Kruger. This town is part of the Kruger. Hmm. Oh, I had a uh, Little meerkats wake me up this morning. I put it on Instagram. <laughs> they were they were knocking on my door this morning, and I I went out and I did a little walk, and there was a big giraffe there. It was it was pretty pretty insane. So like growing up, this is the kind of thing that I saw every single day. Mm. And then you move to the city, and you kind of lose it a little bit, but it's always part of you. Um, and I think living in Cape Town, I get the best of both worlds. I get the ocean, which I love right now because I grew up skateboarding, which mm. is a strange thing for a town that like doesn't have that as a sport you know to <laughs> offer um and then i just did the transition into skateboarding in, uh, into surfing in the ocean loving the ocean and and living on the mountain in cape town so i can be out and with my dogs and and stuff like that i just I, i've always been like an outdoorsy kind of person yes so all of that stuff came before cricket that was all stuff that you had happening before you you got into cricket yeah this is this is what i did before <clears throat> Before I played any cricket, really. Cheapest. I took a sip of, this, <laughs> of my Coke and it just went down the wrong pipe. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> yeah, my, my dad was actually a greenkeeper on a golf course. So I grew up like going with him onto this golf course. And there's loads of wild animals on the course. Uh, we saw many like lion kills and cheetah kills and elephants and like that's kind of what I did as a, as a kid, you know, and, and I played golf. I played golf until I was about 15 mm. um, and then just got so over it, you know, so I spent every single day on the golf course going with my dad. Uh, but then cricket kind of started to take over. I really started to enjoy cricket, um, started to play a lot more men's club cricket. Uh, and then I started to travel like weekends. I wasn't spending as much time like fishing and stuff like that. Now my weekends are school during the week and then weekends I'd be out playing club games and stuff like that so and then once i moved to the bigger cities like pretoria and cape town then it was just full on you know um, yeah. cricket 24 7 was there a moment you you can remember or whether it was like a, an early memory where sort of like cricket really it, it got triggered was there a person that triggered it or a, a an event that sort of really switched it for you yeah i had a call with uh, someone last week and um it's kind of weird because i think when you're playing cricket regularly your answers are kind of different, you know, but now that I haven't been playing for a while, like at least the last couple of months, um, and I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm away from the game a little bit. 
my mind is a little bit more open to what what introduced me to cricket if, if that mm-hmm. makes any sense and like i can clearly remember going to go and visit my cousins in zimbabwe and um they were playing cricket in the backyard and mm-hmm. like because he got a cricket bat for 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 christmas he got a kookaburra i can never i'll never forget it he had this kookaburra cricket bat that he got for christmas and i went and i was like what are you doing and i'd never seen this sport before and literally, that was the, my first ever encounter of cricket. And I think whenever I told people like how I was introduced to the game when I was playing a lot more, like my answer was like slightly different. It was like I play in the school and and so on and everything like it. But that is genuinely the first time I can ever remember seeing a cricket bat and understanding what it was used for. He was knocking it in actually. So yeah, uh, I think being away from the game now a little bit is like just open my memory and my mind as to some of the things that I'd once maybe forgotten. You know? and, wait, and then was there a moment where you were like, I'm actually good at this. This is something that I'm, and I, and I want to take it seriously. Was there a, a sort of defining moment in the, in your story? Uh, yeah. When I was about 15, I think 15 or 16, mm. I started to play men's club cricket. I started to play when I was about 14, actually, just as I went into high school. Um, and I was like now playing with men that were in their 20s, 30s, 40s. You know, this is real club cricket. They didn't have mm. kids playing. Yeah. Uh, so when I was playing, I was opening the bowling for for my club. And you know, I was just, I was flooring grown men. You know, I, I had my captain next to me at mid-off and he was saying, okay, bowl a bouncer. And bowl a bouncer. And I'd, I'd hit this fully grown man who's like 30, you know, and down, down he goes, you know. And um, I was a 14-year-old kid. And, you know, being a 14-year-old kid, I didn't come from a hard family. My family's very loving family and everything like that. But still, I had massive respect for my parents and my elders and everything like that. And you don't, you know, you that's all you do. Yes, sir, a good day, and you greet them and whatnot. Um, but now when I was playing cricket, I had this power that I'd never been given before, you know, as a, wow. as a child, you know. <laughs> And I felt like that was just the most insane feeling that one could ever have, you know, yeah. just like having the power of God, you know, and when I'd go and play school cricket, I was like, this is too easy. You know, these kids are nothing. <laughs> I'm, I'm taking down the grownups on the weekend. You know, I'm going to deal with you, you other 14 year old mere mortals in the, in the <laughs> week. So, you know, the, this, I just had this sense of power and just felt like, oh, I can do this. This is, this is, this is not difficult for me and I want to do this. Um, but yeah, uh, you get a rude awakening once you get into, uh, like when I moved to Pretoria, cause this was all in the, in the bush where I grew up and everything. And once I moved to Pretoria and I started to join the Titans, uh, and started rubbing shoulders with guys that were professional cricketers, hmm. I realized, okay, you know, my level, this is, this is the level that everybody's at, you know, and it became a little bit more difficult. Um, and that's where that's where I was like that's when the, the drive kicked in. I was like, okay, cool. Now I got to now I got to compete. Yeah. You know, whereas before I was just dominating. Yeah, that that's such an interesting way uh, a story. Like that, mu- an, an incredible feeling that it must have been because there's so many kids that I see in the game now that are that are perhaps apprehensive of jumping up a level. Like I've been in Australia and I've had so many kids that are just apprehensive of just going up <clears throat> another level themselves and and pushing themselves and. Like I guess that's the difference. Like you're actually trying to seek that's, out that bit that's that's more difficult, that that level that's that's tougher. Um, what? How did it? Was there? How did you kind of stay? Because it's really easy to probably get a, overconfident in that time and and be like really super. I guess I don't know cocky. And how did you stay grounded in in that sense? Um, I think two ways. Firstly, I went to like at the time was a good school but we had a very average cricket team and we lost all the time mm, wow. <laughs> we just lost <laughs> we got beaten all the time and um and then the other thing is that my grandparents who are actually sitting inside the house over there um you know i'm st- i still come here now if i come and visit them i still come and stay with them and stuff like that my grand she keeps me very humble like there's no chance that you could ever you know there's no ways you know there was no ways that i could ever ever not keep my feet on the ground with my grandparents who are around and my parents. So, um, but I think going to a school where we lost a lot, I just learned how to deal with losing, um, mm. but always wanting to be better. Like I, I didn't like, 
want to lose. I had this competitive drive, but I wasn't a bad loser, uh, but we lost a lot. And then when I moved to Pretoria and I started playing um, for my academy, year, first year I was in the academy, I joined all the other 19-year-olds. So AB, Faf Duplessis, Heino Kun, Rulof van Amerva, Steph Myberg. Wow. You know, I'm shouting out these names, but they all played international cricket. Aaron Pengiso, we were all... Um, Craig, what is his surname now? He played for Namibia. We all in that academy year, we were all in a year together. It was uh, in the 2003 World Cup. Wow. We, we all at some point played a part as being change room attendants or something like that for, you know, for that World Cup. But, um, but yeah, you put us all together and these guys all went to amazing schools. And it was quite uh, uh, an incredible experience because... Uh, we, we were losing cricket games and I was seeing how some of these guys were reacting because they went to good schools like Offies and Pretoria Boys High. They, those schools don't lose. They never lose. Um, so when they started to lose, you could see that they just, this was something that they weren't familiar with. Um, and I was like, guys, you don't understand. I never won a game in school, you know, like this is, <laughs> this is, this is normal for me, you know? Um so uh, I, I felt like just through my schooling and going to a, a, a super normal school um, and having the odd win here and there, it, it kept me kept me humble. So that when I when I got into higher things, like winning was winning was awesome. You know, when you win, I would treasure those moments so much more. But losing was just something that I was very familiar with. That, that's an insane group of people that you've grown up with. Probably like a, a massive part of how strong South Africa became, I guess. Um, but as you as your career obviously start progress, you then you debuted for uh, South Africa at twenty one. Is that right? That to like twenty one. Yeah. And what was that? It, it did it come quickly? Did it was it a bit of a, a quick thing that happened, or was it something that you had to really fight for over a progressive period? No, it, I think it came almost came too quickly. Right. Um, yeah, I had. I'd spent my first year in Pretoria as a as a 19 year old in the academy year, um, and by the end of the year, when our summer kind of uh, uh, started, I got selected to play for the Titans, which is the provincial team. Mm -hmm. You know, we had six franchises now. At the time, I think we had 11 teams. Um, so I made it. I was playing for the Titans, and then the following year, they 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 downscaled from 11 to six. Hmm. and um, neighboring provinces, if there was two neighboring provinces, they became one. So you had like 25, 30 players that were um, now fighting for 15 spots. Yeah, and wow. essentially there was 15 or 16 players that were left to go and find jobs. And I was one of those guys, you know. Um, I think the Titans joined with Easterns and uh, uh, yeah, I, I missed out on a contract, you know, m myself and a bunch of other guys. So the following year, I was just coaching cricket, like at schools, but still trying to play. And Daryl Cullinan was was um, was the captain of Easterns, who had now been joined with the Titans, and he became the Titans captain. And he said, oh, he wanted me to play a couple of games, and I got this pay-for-play kind of contract. I wasn't even contracted. I just played, and then I got paid to play, which was awesome. And then I went back to my day job, which was coaching. And I think I played six games, and... Ray Jennings gave me a call and said, listen, wow. England are touring here in December and you've been picked to play for South Africa. And I was like, how is this even possible? I don't even have a Titans contract and now I'm playing for South Africa. <laughs> so it, was, it happened really quickly. And uh, yeah, although I, I had I was showing great signs of, um, of somebody who could make it and achieve amazing things, I was just very young, you know, yeah. and I just didn't know my craft as well. As I, I should have. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I got into the South African team. I played against England over that summer. I played three test matches in that tour. And um, I got to play in the same team as Makaya and Sean Pollock and Callis and Boucher and Smith and got a taste of it. I really liked it. I, really, I realized that the level was, was uh, uh, beyond me at that stage. It was something that I could get to, but I needed to put in more work. And um yeah, I got dropped from the South African team after yeah. three tests. Yeah, wow. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, that was cool. Um, went back, uh, got a contract with the Titans. They said, we want you now permanently. I was like, yes, finally. And um, and then I, I got signed at Essex. I spent a, a couple months playing for Essex. 
And then I just did, uh, you know, I did my apprenticeship, played a lot of first class cricket. And then I got another call up a couple of years later, I think two years later. And then never missed a test match for like 70 test matches in a row wow. or something silly. Yeah, so it was... It was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, so, so in that in that moment when you got dropped, like, was there any? Did you did you genuinely believe you belonged in Test cricket, or was there any self doubt that that came in? Did you did you feel like, oh, maybe this is, I'm just not at that level, or were you, did you truly have a sense of belonging? I was I was maybe a little bit bummed, but I was also still. Oh. Just was kicked. amazing. Sorry, just sorry. Kicked, it just kicked out there a second, just as you started. It just kicked out. Oh, you're back now. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, I was just saying, like, I think I was just living off the hype of playing for South Africa. You know, so when I was when I was dropped, I, I didn't feel like I was dropped. I felt like mm. I was still playing for South Africa. I'd achieved my goal, you know, of playing for South Africa. Um, and uh, I, I enjoyed it for a small period. You know, I walked around, not with a swagger, but I, I walked around <laughs> knowing, like, I've, rep- I've represented my country. You know, this is, this is really amazing, you know. Um, and, but then the penny dropped after that tour against England. Uh, South Africa toured the West Indies. That was the, the next tour. And I didn't make the squad to go to the West Indies. And that's when I think I realized this, is, this was literally the next, the next tour. So it was a couple of weeks, two weeks after the last test against England. And that's when I realized, oh no, you know, like I, I, I only, I only played a couple of games. I'm not, I'm not actually a, a proper pro tier right now. I only yeah, played right. three games. Um, and that was a little bit sad. Uh, but yeah, got stuck in. I went to, I went to Essex. I played a couple of games. I was no good. Um, I was actually terrible. And then um, when I came back to South Africa, I just had this determined streak to just like, okay, I got to kick this into hyperdrive now, and probably had my best two years of first class cricket, and um, yeah, then South Africa couldn't say no when they wanted me. I went back in, and that was that. <laughs> was there something that you did that you changed to get you into that that next level? Was there something you specifically focused on over that two years? Was it physical, technical, tactical? What was there something that took a forefront i think the best thing was that now i was i was contracted by the titans and cricket was now my job um so i was every day i got to focus on cricket you know every day i had rob walter who is our fitness trainer uh he went on to be the trainer of south africa um he's now one of the head coaches down in new zealand i can't remember which team but he would be my in my ear every single day you know we'd be running and we'd be i wouldn't say we were in the gym but we would do simple workouts and we'd be bowling and whereas before I was like sorry Rob I can't make this training session I've got to go make money I've got to go and do coach I've got to go coach kids you know like at schools like (laughs) you know now now I was being paid to train you know and I was being paid to 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 prep and and get cricket fit and that that was that was the change for me like immediately I could focus 24 7 uh, and knew that at the end of the month I'd get paid you know this is my job now and that's what took me to the next level. And then I just, I was lucky enough that I had some of the best players in the Titans team. I mean, if I, if I shout out the names of the Titans players at the time, you'll be amazed. I mean, yeah, we had Justin Kim, Martin van Yorsveld, Daryl Cullinan, wow. Zander De Brain, Alfonso Thomas, Paul Harris, A.B. De Villiers, Faf Duplessis, Jock Rudolph. I can go wow. through them. Yeah, these guys all played for South Africa for also a significant amount of time. And now I was in the dressing room with them every single day. Whereas before I'd come in and be like, hi guys, I'm playing this game and I'm out. Now I'm with them all the time, yeah. you know? Um, and that's Daryl Cullen. And, and that, this just took my game, you know, literally to the next level. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's, you, you just can't help but get better in that environment. You, there's no way you just can't. Like I've seen pro cricketers that have come into squads and I always just think like, you, you have such an opportunity to get better, whether it's with great players or not, because there's so much more opportunity there for you. But rubbing shoulders with guys like that. Um, and, and then eventually you were in a part of that bowling attack that was like unbelievable. So like you, I mean, Anand Donald said like you, Philander and Morkel were just the best bowling attack that South Africa have ever produced. 
But I mean, you had names that you were reading off before, like Pollock Callis. Like it's just insane the people you were with. What was it? Yeah. What, what was it kind of like being in that that unit? Because they talk about in teams you've you've got bowling units, batting units, but as a bowling unit, what what were some of the roles of the individuals and and the confidence that must have been within that group? What was it? What was it like? It was, look, at the beginning, I mean, I'd, I'd never really met these guys before. You know, I walked into the dressing room. I'd, when I played my first test match for South Africa, we flew into Port Elizabeth, and I'd never met Sean Pollock before. So I walked into the dressing room, and I'm like, hi, Sean, I'm Dale, you know. <laughs> it's just the most bizarre thing, you know. Now I've got to go and play a test match with these guys, yeah. Um but it was just such a big learning curve. And then just, I just wanted to lap it all up as much as I could, you know, and I just took it in from every single person. I mean, it's, it's also, you know, some of the, some of my biggest inspirations that helped me through that period are not even guys that played for South Africa. There was, there was right. guys like Peter Brain who, um, he was just on my case, like every single day, him and Gerald Dross, who was the captain of the Titans for, for a period. These guys were just on my case. They kept every time I was in the nets with them, they would just walk up to me and they'd like shove the ball into my chest, not being rude. And they were like, listen, you don't deserve to be here. He's like, we, we're very lucky to have you here practicing with us. But he's like, boy, you, you got to get out of here and you got to go and play at the wow. top, you know? And they weren't doing it in a rude way. They were just like being like, this is ridiculous, you know? Um, and it was every single day. And I just think I grew a lot of confidence from these guys. I just listened to them. If they said this, I, I did it, you know? And when I listened, when they spoke about money and finances and what they were doing, I was, I was listening, you know, I was just taking everything in. And in a way, I was just growing up the whole time. So when I eventually did play, when I eventually got back into the South African side, I felt like I was a more rounded not just player, but a more rounded human. You know, I, I, I had my, I had my shit in line. You know, yeah, <laughs> I finally had yeah. things. I finally had my ducks in a row, and and I could just get on with business. You know? So, so when you then are, you've been, you were named the number one bowler in the world, and you held that spot as the number one for a long, long time, the longest ever. With that's going to come a load of expectation. So you've talked about how you grew up and and built yourself into that team, but then once you're at the top, there's 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 people who are putting expectation on you, whether that's through the the nation, through the team, maybe even yourself. Um, how did you manage some of that expectation at the time? Did you feel it? Was there a way in which you sort of would would yeah would manage it? Ah, uh, you know, this sounds so cliched, but there's a lot of players that guy. Oh, a lot of people just say like, I I relish that kind of like yeah, yeah. thing, but I you know. I enjoyed it. Like I enjoyed being number one, you know, like it was like, I liked it, you know, it came with this kind of, um, and it, more, more, not more like an outward number one, um, like to the world. <clears throat> I wasn't really bothered that there was somebody uh, sitting in a room in a faraway country who I've never met watching me. I wasn't really bothered about that. I enjoyed it more that Graham Smith had this look in his eye and he would come to me and he'd give me the ball and he's like, you're my number one. I need a wicket right now. And I need you to do this for me. And I was like, yes, sir, I will do whatever you want <laughs> me to do, you know, like, and, and just by doing what he wanted me to do and like giving me like that opportunity, I ran through walls for him basically. And, um, and then I was lucky enough that I got, you know, I got that ranking, you know, and, um, and it wasn't, it was through skill, but it was also through him. He always saw opportunity. And when he saw an opportunity to, or needed an opportunity to be created, he always came to me. And there's, that's, again, it's a great feeling to have that like, you've got like this, somebody's got major confidence in you to, to be able to do something for you. Um, and then, and, and then I scored off of it too, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, and I'll use a small example, Paul Harris. Paul Harris probably would have taken another 100 test wickets had he played in another test team because every time he took a wicket, he'd bowl 15 overs and then eventually get his wicket. And as he'd get the wicket, <clears throat> Graham would say, okay, thanks, Paul. And he's like, I've just got a wicket. And then Graham would give me the ball and I'd go, <laughs> bang, bang. I'll take two. You know, I'd get the new batter out and, a, and another batter out, you know? And then I'd struggle a little bit. And then they'd go, okay, Paul, he has the ball again. And he'd be like, are you kidding me? I'll do the donkey work again, you know? So um, so I think in that way, it also, 
<clears throat> it reflected in my strike rate. You'll see my strike rates yeah. extremely low. It's insane. And that's because, yeah, that's because Graham used me like that, you know, like, yeah, I still had to take the wicket, but I mean, I was always brought back at those at those times, um, and that helped me become number one and hold that ranking for for such a long time. You know, yeah. so it's it's really due to to good captaincy. You know, what what I'm hearing from a lot of the stuff you're saying is that a lot of your confidence came from people outside of yourself, really, like your teammates, both at Titans and then actually like there, Graham Smith. So. Is that where you tend to get a lot of your? You, you felt a huge sense of that confidence coming from those other people. Oh, uh, massively. Um, you know, I always felt like I had, um, in a in a small way, I always felt like I had this uh, thing. It's called imposter syndrome. I don't know if you know. Yeah, if you've ever yeah. heard of that. I've felt it. Yeah, yeah massively. <laughs> yeah, where you like, jeepers, I'm 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 not really that good. You know, these people don't realize that I'm not that good. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, um. It's some. It's this one person that feels like I can do it, and I just do it, and I get a wicket. But I'm like, I'm not doing anything amazing. I'm just bowling the ball in the same place, which I suppose has a skill, um, yeah. you know. And I'm doing it at, at a high speed. Um, yeah. And somebody else is, is pushing that switch when they need it to happen, and then I just do it, you know. Yeah. But if I had to kind of captain and run my own space. I mean, I would ne probably never have achieved the things that I've achieved. So I always needed somebody else to kind of like say, you you ah! are good, you are what we need. And yeah. That's really I mean, interesting. Like that. That, so where did yeah. you, when you were preparing for a, whether it's a test match or a, or a series, was there something that you did to mentally prepare yourself, get yourself into the right frame of mind? Um, I mean, at the time we were just playing so much, you know, I just kind of, just I was just playing. Um, I just loved being in the same dressing room as guys like Pouch and Donald. I loved listening to the stories that he used to tell, and then I'd try and go and do the same thing, you know, on the on the field. But uh, in preparation, um, I suppose I just like playing, and I did have a competitive edge. I I wanted to always get batters out, um, and I always wanted to floor players. Like I love that. Like mm. I wanted. This, if I couldn't get them out, I wanted them physically out. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, prep was prep was pretty simple. It was just bowl, 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 bowl more and play, 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 and you get into a rhythm, and then you should be okay. Sorry if it's noisy. A whole bunch of people have just come in. No, that, that's okay. Um, <laughs> the um, so the so your preparation would look so much sounded so much like you just got it from actually doing and practicing. Um, and, and putting yourself out there. Was there a time where you felt you were you were struggling for that confidence, but you still had to go on the field? You were struggling and you, you just, and, and what sort of got you through those those periods? Uh, yeah, like all the time. Um, hmm. I always felt like I was struggling. I'm not even gonna lie, <laughs> you yeah. know? Um, but I, I've, I felt like I built up a good poker face. Um, yeah, right. And uh, and I may have told people this before. Like uh, I would, I remember playing against England at the Oval. I'll just use one example. And um, I, I I was exhausted the day before. I'd bowled twenty overs, twenty two overs, or something like that. In the day, I was pretty exhausted. And I just when I was in the dressing room, I could hardly tie my boot laces. I was that tired. But I was like, okay, cool. I'm gonna have a coke now. I'm gonna run out onto the field. And I'm going to use whatever energy I've got to bounce around like a bunny rabbit. I'm going to be kicking the soccer ball. I'm going to be doing everything. And I'm just going to fake this as much as I can. And when the, when the English walk down, I'm going to make it like really present that I'm here for business today. And um, I got five in that in wow. the second innings against England. It's the same test match when Hashim got a triple. Wow. hundred. And I was just like, I was exhausted, but I was like, I'm going to go out there and I'm just going to, I'm going to fake it and I'm going to make them basically shit themselves, you know, that I'm here for, I'm here for the competition. Yeah. And I felt like I had to do that every single time I went onto a cricket field, you know, like I had to kind of be like really out there and like, uh, just to show that I was, I was, I was up for the competition. But meanwhile, when you walk back into the dressing room, and you get back into your little safe space. There's a lot of like 
doubt and there's a lot of like you're sitting there and you're trying to get yourself going you know and you're drinking your favorite drink you know so you can try and bring back those memories and those feelings of of what you've had in the past like oh, i've taken five wickets in the past i had a green energy oh, i'm going to grab the green energy and i'm going to drink that and i'm going to try and you know and I'm, I'm trying to get everything every cell in my body to feel the same way i did when i've when i performed at my best when i don't feel like i can yeah so that when i go out there i can just you know fake it because uh, i mean when you saw you on the field you were so energetic you were aggressive and like now you're you're such a lovely guy but there's a separation between the person and the persona so do you feel that's really really important for people in sport whether it's cricket or any sport to have that separation between who you are as a person and the persona that's on the field definitely you know like well for me it was like i wanted to sorry i really wanted to build the way that i looked i wanted to build this kind of uh, like character you know yeah. and when i was i can remember building my run-up and my bowling action and my style and i always said to myself at the top of my mark i wanted to be i think it was shy i wanted to have shy um actors mentality like pure aggression pure speed mm-hmm. when i was running in i wanted to have brett lee's um energy like he, and his focus you see when brett lee is bowling and he's quickest like you zoom in on those eyes, and those eyes, they, they, they meant business. Uh, when I hit the crease, I wanted to have the poetry in, in motion of Alan Donald. You know, just a beautiful action, everything all working in sync. And when I let go of the ball, I wanted to have the direction and um, accuracy of a, a Sean Pollock. And then I wanted to have the wickets of dale stain basically yeah. <laughs> that's uh, that's that's what i saw um that was in my run-up in my bowling action and everything like that and then when i was playing i wanted to have the character of somebody like shane Warne, uh nice. w- embodied in a in the old west indian fast bowler you know like uh, sure. whoever it was from the past you know um and i wanted to play the game i wanted to be in people i never wanted to swear at anybody i, I never swore at anybody I, I mean i may have made a mistake once or twice in my career but i didn't do it on a regular basis i would mm. more tell somebody that they're not good and i was going to get them out um as opposed to swearing at them or something like that but i, I was there for the the theatrics um of of cricket too which is somebody like i thought shane Warne was brilliant at it yeah. and i thought he bought a lot of wickets and i was like well on days when I'm not good, maybe I can buy a couple of wickets. You know, that's how I'm going to get a wicket. So I was never going to be the best player in the world, but I, if I if I could build up this whole kind of character, and I and it worked well, I would I would do okay. So it's, that's it's how like I kind this of con- it. concoction of all of these greats and all of these people that you clearly have either played against or, or watched and loved, and then that's made the authentic version of Dale Stain. Like that's made who you are. Is that is that about right? Is that is that how you kind of felt that's, it? <laughs> that's exactly what it is and it, and it started off like that when i was like 20 maybe 21 and i just did it i did it over and over again i could literally remember being at the top of my mark and thinking actor and then like wow. click into that zone you know lee donald pollock stain you know and and i do that and then i did that so many times that eventually it just became a natural thing you know so eventually when I was standing at the top of my mark, now I had to worry about something else. As soon as you started playing IPL, I'd start worrying about where is this guy going to hit me for six now? Right. You know, so I couldn't be thinking like that. But um, but it just that's that's how I started. And it became a natural thing where eventually it just took over. You know, I, I took over and that's who I was. So when you were, like you said there in 2020, when you're under pressure, was there something that you would focus on when you did when you're in those crunch moments, like you've played so much one day cricket, so much 2020 cricket, and even test matches that have had that, those pressure moments. What, what are you thinking when you're in, in all of that environment, the chaos is coming from the crowd, like the IPO, I can imagine is just like another ball game, but like with the crowds going, your team going, your, yourself going, what are you thinking of? I mean, there's a part of you that gets into the zone as, as everyone says, you know, you just get into that focused zone where, you, you're not really thinking, you're kind of reacting, you know, and yeah. um, or, or you're just doing, not really reacting. If you're reacting, that's a bit too late. You, you're just doing, you know, and, and sometimes when you're in the moment so much, you, you can feel the moment and you can change fields 
because you're so confident in what your skill set is and, and you've got a high belief in what you can deliver that you can do certain things. I, I've had some very strange fielding positions before, you know, where captains are like, are you sure? And I'm like, I know the ball's not going to go there. There's just no chance the ball's going to go there. So don't even worry about that guy. You know, let's, let's put him here. Yeah. Um, and you just get into that kind of like, zone but then there's other times that you've got doubt you know you do have doubts and when that creeps in i was lucky that i i always loved the, the mental coaches that came into the south african team you know from jeremy snape to patty upton yeah um we've had numerous different ones I, I, we had uh i can't remember what his name is now he worked at the spring bucks when they won the world cup um oh if you google it it will come up yeah um I, and I always just enjoyed spending time with these guys and, and understanding like what is what do you have to do when you when your when your job is on the line, you know? And there's a lot of worse things uh, in life than, than cricket, you know. If you speak mm. to somebody like Mike Horn or a doctor, you know, if they make one mistake, then then someone dies. You know, if I make a mistake, somebody hits me for six. It's not the end of the world, <laughs> you know. Um, but we both use the same skills to to calm ourselves down so that we can focus on what we want to do. Um, so Jeremy and, and Patty developed some things for me in particular, for myself to kind of think about and work on when times are tough. And I would always kind of go back to those and revert back to those things if I felt like I was under pressure. But for the most time, I always wanted to just let my natural instinct take over. Were they practices, were some of those practices you did off the field, so in your own time as well, rather than just solely on the pitch? A little bit. I mean, I had to bring some of that into my, into, into my life. And I was fortunate that somebody like Paddy, who's... He's just, he's such a good friend of mine now that mm. we have a, we have a session, you know, like he's, he's a psychiatrist or psychologist that I'll go and see. Um, but I won't go and sit down on the couch with him and we talk, mm -hmm. you know, we go for a surf or we go for a run and <clears throat> he's got such a wonderful way of delivering a message so that we can just go and have an, have an exercise somewhere. And, uh, I'll come away from that. And I'm thinking this guy has just given me a whole session, <laughs> you know, <laughs> after one surf, you know, um, <laughs> Uh, I mean, I can't put my finger down on anything right now, um, but I mean, that's how we would do it. And then often I'd go into a in, into a tournament, and you know, the three or four times that I'd seen him leading leading into that, I just use what we had spoken about during that period to yeah. to work through that one tournament, and it might change for the next one, and, and so. Yeah. There's there's so many cricketers and athletes around the world that are suffering with like a, a lack of self confidence or a lack of like an ability to deal with pressure and the anxieties are through the roof. Um, is there anything that you would advise, whether it's a young cricketer, or young athlete in what has helped you to build that, that clarity through pressure in those moments? Um, you speak a lot about your surfing and your exercise outside of sport. Is, is that a key part to it? So separating yourself away from the sport and getting some time away? I think, you know, there was, there's a couple of things. Yeah. I don't want to give everybody life lessons, you know, yeah. but, I think um, one thing that was said to me early on was that if I'm willing to accept that I'm going to have more bad days in cricket than good days, then then I'm going to be a successful cricketer. That was literally one of the best pieces of advice I ever got when I was younger. And I was like, uh, yeah, I'll take that on, you know. Mm. And I was fortunate enough that I actually probably had better days than I had bad days. But that was the, that was what he said to me. That was um, a, a gentleman by the name of Francois Upton who passed away. Um, he was a very good friend of mine and looked after me for a long time. And, uh, and I was like, okay, cool. That's, that's, that sounds like something that I'm, I'm willing to take. I'm willing to take that risk. Um, and other things is when I see kids, like their parents, they always come and they say, oh, my kid just plays cricket and what can he do to bowl fast or bat better? And I say, hey, do, are, are they playing any other sports? And it's like, no, it's just cricket. Uh, how old is your kid? No, he's nine. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> Jesus, you know? Yeah. Get, get him a bicycle um, so he can learn how to fall a couple of times, you know, and get up. Um, get him a skateboard so he can see how to, like, see himself landing a trick before he tr tries yeah. to attempt it, you know, and teaches you, you know, visualization. Uh, get him a hockey stick so that he can learn hand-eye coordination. Just do everything, you know, yeah. and try. Just try and do everything. And then when you decide what it is that you want to really be, whether it be a doctor or a cricketer or something like that, all of those skills will at some point come in hand, no? Yeah. Um, 
And yeah, I, I think yeah, it, it it does help. And like as sitting here as like a as a pretty much retired cricketer right now, I think one of the biggest things that we don't deal with in sport is just um, is losing and uh, and also um, not being part of a team, you know, or anything mm. like that. When you when you lose your place in a in a mm. in a team, you know. Um, I think that's also a difficult thing. You know, I, I sit here and I, I don't have any teammates around me. When you're in the team, it's easy. You've got, you know, 10 other guys that are, are talking to you and patting your back. But it's difficult when you go back home and you're in your own apartment or you're in your own home and you and you by yourself, you know. Um, so it's also good to build a good structure around yourself so that you've got backing and, and people to help you. Um I mean, simple. It sounds simple, but it's pretty tough. <laughs> I mean, that's that's very sound, solid life advice. I think that's just, uh, <laughs> it doesn't get much better than that. Was there someone that you really admired at a young age, like someone that you really looked up to, wanted to emulate? I know was, you've spoken about the people that in the game you're trying to emulate whilst you're on the pitch, but was there perhaps someone away from the sport that you just truly admired that had a, an impact in your life? Yeah, there was a skateboarder. I skateboarded when I was younger. I actually still, I'm, I'm skating again now. I love it. I've um, seen, yeah, it looks and, awesome. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not even going to lie. There was a stage when I hit about 19 where I had, to, when I moved to Pretoria, there was, there was this idea in my mind that I could go in the direction of becoming a pro skateboarder or I want to play cricket. Cricket ultimately took over because it paid more money than skateboarding. Right, so, yeah. you know, I went that way. But, but growing up, there was a sca- skateboarder. His name was Jeff Rowley. He's actually from England. Right. He lives in California right now, and he was just the he was just the man. You know, for me, he was just absolutely amazing. I love his style. I love the his attitude. Um, I love his never give up kind of. He 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 would fall a lot. He was always scarred, but he always did like the craziest stuff, and he made it look so good. And I like that about cricket, you know, uh, about skateboarding. He's skateboarding, and I wanted to put that into my cricket. I I wanted it to look really good, but I wanted to have all those, you know, attributes that he had, like that never give up, in your face. So he's different. You're like he's in your face towards like a handrail or a set of stairs or whatever it is that he's doing a trick on, but I'm in your face to my mm-hmm. competitor to the to the batter on the other side, and I absolutely loved it. Um, and I met him a couple of years ago and uh, we've, we've been in contact on Instagram and, and whatnot. And he played a bit of cricket too. So it was kind of strange that he knew who I was, but I just loved him <laughs> wow. as an idol throughout my years. So it's kind of weird how the world works. But yeah, he, he, was the, he was the one guy and he had nothing to do with cricket. You know, he's not like yeah. he played for England or anything like that. No. Um, but yeah, then other guys like Roger, Federer, mm. Tiger Woods, you know, they drive the way they do things. I mean, they're, they're heroes for many people, but... Yeah, um, you can take a lot of things out of them, but him in particular, you know, he was you, amazing. You spoke. Uh, you actually put a thing on your Instagram. I saw of you. You put a post up of you skateboarding, and then like, the next post was said, "We fall a lot." And yeah, is how important do you feel that is of of actually falling down, dusting yourself off, and getting back up? And were there some perhaps moments because obviously towards the like closer now in your career you've had more injuries and that's natural for a bowler like it's just an absolute assault on the body um so were there moments for you where there were some really tough moments and what was the the energy you you drew on in those in those times yeah i think skateboarding helped me through that like it's so strange because you do you do you, you falling all the time and it helped me with two things because i would try and attempt a trick for a week before I would eventually get it right, you know? Um, and you'd fall the entire time, but I'd get up and I'd do it again. And I'd get up mm-hmm. and I'd do it again, over and over and over again. And not just fall, like you physically hurt yourself. You know, you, you know, hurt your elbow and your hand or your knees, your ankles, it doesn't matter. Um, and then the other side of that was just that visualization. You know, I had to stand there because imagine standing at the top of a set of stairs and you trying to do go down these stairs if you if you can't see yourself doing it before you attempt it you're gonna break your ankle you're gonna break something you know yeah right so when i went into playing cricket and we had a woman her name was dawn saunders 
she was our visualizing coach. She was trying to teach all these 18 year old boys what visualization was. I was like, I've got this. Like, I know what this is. Like, I've been doing this for years. What are you trying to teach me? And it was, it was actually weird because in her lessons, I was, I was young and I was a bit silly at the time. I used, I thought she was just talking rubbish. So I used to sleep in her lessons. And at the end of the year, I actually got student of the year. I mean, how ridiculous is that? I was like, Dawn, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> That's, amazing. That's incredible. Yeah. I think all my, all my academy mates were like, this is just, this is why, you know, but, um, but yeah, I think skateboarding kind of taught me that. And then I was able to take that into, into, into my sport. And the later years when I started to struggle with my shoulder, when I broke my shoulder a couple of times, I was able to draw onto that kind of those experiences that I had as a youngster and what I'd learned through doing that just to get myself through it, you know? Um, so I think that definitely helped. And it's and the kids kids nowadays like they want they do want to see those results like so quickly. But like you said there, like learning a trick in a week and the amount of times you're going to fall down. So if there's anything people can take from that, it's just constantly give it a go. Just get back up, keep going because you never really know when the tipping point is. You'd like when you get yeah. that tr- trick, when you you get into the team, you get that fifa, you get whatever. It just clicks and happens. So- Absolutely. And the uh, sorry to. But the That's craziest right. thing is that, like, it would take a week to 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 land something. You know, mm. I can remember going there and like, and knowing also we'd go with a, like the camera. And at the time, we we never had phones or anything like that, so you'd have to have a roll of film. And you go and you'd film it, and I wouldn't land it. And I'd be like, guys, we're wasting money here, you know, because we're just getting like bails, you know. <laughs> but anyway, eventually, what would happen is that you'd get this kind of pressure, not just because you wanted to land it because now I'm wasting our parents' money, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so there was, there was that pressure too. And then the strangest thing is that when you do land it and you get that feeling, you can put it into your mind. You can remember what it mm. was. Well, I certainly could. And I would land it three, four, five, six times after I'd landed it the first time, but it took me a week to do it. And in cricket it was a similar thing. Once I, once I realized how to take five wicket holes, like, and how to take wickets on a regular basis, I just like got locked in here and it was like, okay, this is easy. I can do this, you know? Yeah. Um, but it took a little bit before, you know? <laughs> yeah. So on the flip side of all that, it was there moments, was there a singular moment or many moments that you were at your most proud, like when some really proud moments within throwing your career? Yeah, there was a, there was a period where I was, um, where I was trying to really focus on myself just so that I could be the best that I could be so I can get into the team. And there was a lot of hard work there. And there was a lot of like rubbing shoulders with the best guys in the world to learn from them and everything. But then my proudest moments came was that when I felt I was at the peak of my powers and I was able to contribute to other people's lives. Like that was when I was like, yes, you know, this, this is why we do this. Um, I think beating Australia in Australia, beating England in England, uh, six months apart, Mm. was was incredible um i got onto a bus and my heroes were was was like jock callis you know he was mm. just the he was the ultimate you know this guy if you ever want to see a professional jock callis is the ultimate professional his bats are i don't know if you hear that my phone his bats are pristine his kit is perfect his pads are clean he is just everything is perfect and you know we we, we won in melbourne and we won the second test in Melbourne. We won the first test in Perth. And I got into the bus and here's this, ga- this man, this gentleman, and he's crying on the bus because he'd gone to Australia and he'd been spanked, you know, five or six times before. He had seen how his heroes had been beaten. Um, and now he was there and he was able to win. And I was like, th- that was the proudest moment for me. I was like, okay, cool. I've contributed to this man's life. You know, this, this guy's wow. a the life-changing moment that's that's cool you know doesn't matter whether you take five wickets or if you score 100 or something like that like this guy's life has just changed you know that's yeah. pretty that's that was that was pretty cool yeah and i mean there's so much pride around playing for south africa as well i, I did a few um, i did many pre-season tours for sussex in um in port Elizabeth. And I remember we actually went and watched a one day series whilst you guys were playing when we had a day off from our training camp. But at the time there was a huge push in the in the media or the the sponsors of of South Africa for the like protein fire, the the real there was some really like uh, 
okay, what's the best word for it? Like these deep and like rich adverts that you guys were in really about the cap, the badge, the country. And it was almost very similar to like Invictus, like the film Invictus. Like it was, there was real, that passion for South Africa. Like what was that feeling like within the team around playing for a nation at that time when you are playing with players that are, you're in a period of success. Like the team's obviously very different now to what it was when you were playing in, in it in that peak period and that number one in the world. So what was it like with all of that, with the nation right behind you and experiencing all that? It was slightly different being in the team versus what we were putting out to the public. Um, right. it, we, were, we had Graham in particular, I think with Jeremy Snape, had come up with this idea of, of, of trying to really create our own identity as a cricket team. You know, um, I think the Springboks have done so well with it. And, and another team like the All Blacks have done very yes. well with it. And we thought, okay, well, it's our turn. You know, we've got... We've got amazing players and we're doing great things. And how do we take this to the next level, you know? And the way to take it to the next level is to get the backing of the nation, you know? Not just uh, the odd win here and there. <clears throat> is to actually feel like the whole nation is behind you when you go to a thing like a World Cup and there's no doubt. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the messages within the team was, was very much the way that we wanted to do things and play for each other and everything. And, that, and that's where I mean, like, that proudness came. Like, my proudest moments was because the guys next to me were starting to do well, you know. Mm. We had guys like Hashim scoring triple hundreds and uh, um, it was just, it was incredible. You know, we had, we had black guys, colored guys, Indians, or, or white people all in the same team. And, and now we're making it work. You know, yeah. we're making this we're making this work. Some are Afrikaans, some are English, some are Muslim, some are religious, some are not religious. Yeah. And we've got these guys and we like we're gonna we're gonna make this work now, you know, and this is the this is the country that we got. Um and then we had a great advertising agency that kind of put out these messages for us to to the public. That sometimes got a bit corny, I must be honest with you. I mean, I remember <laughs> a kid once once coming up to me and we we called it Protea Fire. And it was somebody else that came up with a name and suggested it to us. And we're like, oh, that sounds that sounds cool. You can run with that. And this kid came up to me and he's like, uh, like Darth Vader or whatever. He was like, may the Protea fire be with you. And I was yeah. like, that's that's cool, you know? But like, it's not really like that in the dressing room. But yeah. you know, yeah, like, yeah. it is good, you know? But we, we were finally getting the backing of, of, of the country, you know? And, and really felt like we were building something. Um, and within the team, the language is not the same that we were sending out to the public. It was that was you know advertising with sugar coating, but it was this, it was the same. But mm. the team was you know, the team was in a wonderful space, like a really wonderful space, and we were very proud of the of the stuff that we were doing and able to then bridge the gap between the cricketers and the public, you know, and really allowing them into our personal space and that. And just felt like if we were able to do that, we could get more backing. So it was a wonderful time. Like it was a really great campaign they they're still on it now i mean i'm not much in the proteas anymore so i don't know how it runs now but they're still on it now i know that um some of the traditions that we had started with our team song and when we win series and and all of that yeah. kind of stuff yeah, they're still doing all of that kind of stuff so it's that's nice to see that they're still doing that how you like you spoke about graham smith a lot how did you had so many great players playing in that team how did that get managed because it's very easy to have such good players have their own agenda to want to do their own things, especially at professional and international level. What what really was the thing that brought everyone together? Um, because you like you said that the All Blacks and the Springboks, and I would definitely say that South African cricket team are the three teams that I think of when it comes to like that, from an outward sense, looking like togetherness, that connection with the 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 communities, the the nations. But what what do you feel was there one thing that really allowed you to to come together and play it truly as a team? Sure. Um, I don't know if I could put my finger down on one thing, mm. but I think at the time we just had, we had such wonderful players. They were all at the peaks that we, we didn't have to concentrate on anything in particular, you know? Sorry, I just got a call yeah. there. Sorry. Um, uh, you know, you know, I think of the players that we had, Hashim Amlo was averaging over 50. Callis was averaging 57. Graham, as an opening batter, averaging 50. A.B. de Villiers. We just had, 
everyone was really good, you know, mm. like really, really, really good. Um, so we just had, we had to have good man management and Graham was fantastic at it. Gary Kirsten came in and did a great job um, along with Paddy and the support staff and just steered the ship for, for the team. Jeepers, sorry, I keep getting phone calls. Yeah, this is <laughs> keep cutting out. Yeah, um, but yeah, I think the I think I think and you've got a good captain and you've got a good coach. You know, they're able to to manage things. And um, when you've got a captain, my goodness, it's okay. So, I'm so sorry. That's yes, right. my phone is now trying to ring you the whole time. Um, but yeah, when you've got a good captain and a good coach, they can they can steer the ship in 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 a great direction. Um, and when you've got fantastic players to back it, that's mm. that's even better. Is there is there a skill or an attribute that you think that the best have at that level, like that sets them apart from everyone else? Something whether it's, uh, yeah, maybe a mental or mindset difference that just you have seen commonly between the best, the real best, and everyone else. Yo, I've seen so many different players be so good at everything. You know, like yeah. I spoke of Callis. Callis being like very meticulous in the way that he handles his kit and he is the ultimate professional. And then you get somebody like Quinny de Kock. Quinny de Kock would pick up a cashmere willow bat and he'd still smack 100 in, in an <laughs> IPL game, you know, with a, a, a strike rate of 160. You know, so it really is just sometimes it's, it's it boils down to just, just talent. Um, and then other times it boils down to like really hard work and like, um, just being so focused on on what you want and and your kits and and everything like that, uh, I always struggle to kind of find a line. But I think if you can find a healthy balance, um, then then you 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 should be okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, thinking of somebody like Quinny de Kock, Quinny de Kock <laughs> is is mentally incredibly strong and yeah. doesn't believe that any bowler in the world is good enough to get him out. Um, and don't get me wrong, if he gets out, it's not like you walk into the dressing room and he'd be like, ah, oh, that guy shouldn't have got me out. But he, he just genuinely feels like that he's so good that nobody can get him out. Um, but then when it comes to his equipment, like, it's all over the show, you know? It's like, you know, he's getting better. Like, I'm going to give him credit, but he's getting better. But like I said, you could give him a cashmere willow bat, and I, I guarantee you, he would still score 100. Like, <laughs> That's just that's just who he is, you know. So I guess it's just about being your like most just authentically you, just doing your thing, finding what works for you, the balances that you're going to find in and out of the sport that just levels you out. It is difficult saying that, you know. It's easy saying it from the position where I'm where I'm in because I've achieved what I've had. But and you know, you also have to rely on the coaches and stuff. Like if you've got an individual that is slightly different. Um, but it's got amazing talent and, and, a, and a coach doesn't like that, then, you know, sometimes that kid might not make it, you know, like, and that's because of the person that's picking him. So it's difficult for me to say that you've got to be your own, but I think the majority of the time, like, it, it, it all, you always come back to who you are, you know, yeah. you always, that's what it will always boil back to who you, who you are. Um, so you've got to follow that instinct and just go with it. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm so cautious of taking up, too much of your time and i've got um just a few more things oh no that, that it's been... fine actually i was moving stuff uh, we got some new furniture for my grand and that and i think i've got everyone trying to phone me <laughs> <laughs> like delivering and stuff like that it's so silly um but the, so with all of this what what would you give yourself what advice would you give your younger self um I had a good answer for this the other day and, and um, um, my youngest of the South that, that played for South Africa originally, um, my first three games, I was kind of like, I, I was grabbing the badge and I was kissing the badge and I was trying to be like, so like proving that I'm like, I'm, yeah, you know, I'm playing for South Africa. But then I, I quickly realized that playing for South Africa is also a business, um, yeah. you know, years later. And that if you're no good, you know, they will find somebody to to replace you, you know, and it's just like normal work, you know, like if the guy that's cleaning my pool is leaving my pool a little bit shady and green, 
I'm just going to find someone else who can clean my pool, you know? <laughs> no matter how much he loves his pool company, I'm just going to be like, sorry, dude, you don't do a good job. You're getting somebody <laughs> else in. And, um, and like, if I could give myself, my younger self, some advice, like, although I would never change anything because I, I, I'm lucky I got to where I got and everything like that, I would, I would have just said, listen, focus on, the, focus on the game, you know? Focus on getting the ball in the right place. Focus on bowling it. Keep your foot behind the line. Don't bowl a no ball, you know? Build pressure take wickets and use that energy to do that rather than kissing the badge and looking up at the heavens and being thankful for, for everything. Cause it's, it's, it is great. It is a massive privilege to play for your country. And it, you know, I can thank God for my, my skill and everything like that. But on that moment there and there, you know, you have to be able to do and deliver what everybody wants you to do and deliver, you know? Mm. Um, so I would focus more energy on, on doing that uh, and save the badge kissing and, and all that other stuff when you may be in your room by yourself, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so are there, are, there some, are there values that you hold that you think are really critical to you and that have helped you get where you are throughout your career and where you are now? Some like core values that you, you think of? I think just being a good, good, good person, you know, like I, that's, I've always tried to be a, a nice guy. I've always tried to be uh, like, the guy that I can I can walk into the opposition dressing room um, and I can go and have a chat to them even though I've just tried to knock the guy's head off you know mm. and um, and he can chat to me but he must know that the next time he's playing against me I'm going to do it again you mm. know <laughs> and able to kind of draw the line between who I who I who I pretend to be on a cricket field and who I actually am um, I think that's the most important thing um, take all the things that i've achieved in cricket away and all that really matters is who who you are like i've tried to maintain that with my family and my friends the entire time you know so that they never think that i'm unapproachable or above them um and i think that through my grandparents and my parents and some of the people that i've surrounded myself with they've managed to help me in that and just keep me like grounded like that that that's it really you know like mm. yeah and um, my skill got me to... so yeah my phone again just ringing <laughs> but yeah it, the um the pandemic has obviously hit a lot of people hard and i believe it's it's trying to teach us a lesson of something um do you feel if if the pandemic was trying to tell us anything what is what is she trying to tell us do you think i Sure, there's probably a lot, hey, eh? but um, I've just really felt like I've gotten closer to um, to like my family and some of the some of the times that I've been away. I travel a lot. I, I did travel a lot and um, realized that I'd missed out on so much. And um, that lockdown period made me realize that, you know, being away from home and living in a hotel and some of the things that I've missed out on my life, like I'm not going to get that time back. So I'm, I'm trying to make up for it now, you know? Yeah. So that's why I'm probably a little bit more picky and choosy as to which tours that I want to go on. If, if a tour is stretching longer than, you know, six weeks or something or seven weeks, which is what some of them are. Um, I might just go, no, I'm not interested, you know? Um, mm -hmm my grandparents are coming to visit and they're old and I'd much rather spend my time with them now, you know, uh, I get that it's that I can do that. This is my, my own journey now, but like, I can't give that advice to somebody like an Aiden Markham, you know, who's 24 yeah. and he's like, Oh, I can't miss this tour. You know, yeah, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, dude, yeah. you gotta, you gotta do what you gotta do. But for me, this is, this for me is more important right now. Um, so yeah, so I, I'm just trying to connect in, in that way. And, maybe even connect with myself, you know, a little bit more. Um, and this, this lockdown and COVID has really allowed me to do that. And, you know, the people that are around me now, like my friends that are around me now, I know that they're, they're, they're the, they're the tightest we're ever going to be, you know? Yeah. So that's also cool. I mean, you're in a place, an amazing place to do it. People that are going to see the video of this, like where you're at, where you're at, you're so like out, out in nature. And obviously if they follow you on Instagram and social media, they'll see where you're at in the world. Um, look, last thing is there, is there like a, a book, a film, any sort of like recommendation you, you are always giving people that 
you always think has maybe had an impact on on yourself it could be it could be like a film or a documentary and anything goodness um i not one in particular but like mm. i i get through my years i've been inspired by different things so and and i love watching people that are really good at what they do mm. as long as it looks it must look good for the eye. You know, that's a thing. Like you can take two people and um, one can be better than the other, but if the other one makes it look better, then I'll, I'll, I'll follow that person more, mm. you know, if, if that makes sense. So style and steez is, is, is something that I like. And then I draw inspiration from that. So I watch, I'm watching a lot of like surfing films now. There's a surfer, his name is Harrison Roach. He's yeah. from Australia. He's amazing. And any surf craft that he gets on to be it a long board or a short board or mid length or whatever it is, he just makes it look so beautiful, you know? And, and again, you take that into crickets and it's like, okay, you know, five, five day game, one day game, T20. And that's how my brain works, you know, long board, short board, mid length, whatever. <laughs> and I'm just trying to make it look that good. And I'll, I'll watch him and then I just draw inspiration about how good he is at what he does and how beautiful he makes it look. And then I'm, and he still has the sa same outcome. You know, um, he still wins, and so I, I I just do that. But there's but there's no real book or, or or movie that I watched that I could recommend to to people. Just there's there's individuals that I I recommend. Spend a little bit of time watching them. If they're your cup of tea, you might enjoy it. If they're not, you know, then try somebody else. Yeah. Wow, Dale. Look, we've covered so much in this. This has been. Um... <laughs> amazing like some of the stuff you've given is just incredible and um thank you so much for for giving your time i'm super thankful um it's a pleasure <laughs> uh, and uh yeah uh, obviously people can find you on social media at dale stain and yeah just if they if they just look you up they're going to find more about you but thank you again for doing this this has been uh phenomenal yeah it's a pleasure um i thought i'd quickly show you uh this is this is my grandfather's old bar and there's a uh, South African oh, wow. flag there. Yeah. Um, they're waving inside. They're very excited. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's nice to be here. And yeah, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it was really cool. Thanks. Really, really appreciate it.